what do hackers, a multinational gaming company, and this XKCD comic have to do with cryptography? Watch this video where I explain this in the story about my favorite mega number. The Sony PlayStation 3 was released in 2006, and just like with previous consoles, it was an interesting target for hackers who wanted to run homebrew, pirate games, or just tackle the challenge of breaking its protections. Over the years, many different attacks have been performed against the PlayStation 3, and in this video we will look at a particularly interesting one from a cryptography standpoint. In December of 2010, the hacker group called Fail Overflow gave a presentation at the Chaos Computer Congress in Germany, where they describe a number of different vulnerabilities and exploits in the PlayStation 3. As the grand finale of their presentations, they revealed that Sony had made a mistake in their implementation of the cryptographic algorithms used to create signatures in the console, leading to not just breaking individual signatures, but a full recovery of the private key, allowing anyone to create signatures just as valid as the ones from Sony. They did not reveal any keys themselves during the presentation. However, a few days later, famous hacker George Hotz, known as GeoHotz, posted a set of keys on his website thanking Fail Overflow for their work. So, how does this flaw work and what does it mean in the context of the PlayStation 3? To answer this, we must first look at two things. The PlayStation 3 chain of trust and some elliptic curve cryptography. When the PS3 boots, it does so in several stages. First, the secure boot stage, which is stored directly in hardware, starts executing. It will read the bootloader from read-only memory, verify its integrity, decrypt it, and execute it. The bootloader will in turn load the level 0 loader, ver verify its integrity, decrypt it, and execute it. Finally, the level 0 loader will then read the meta loader, verify its integrity, decrypt it, and execute it. The meta loader then goes on and performs similar operations, including loading more pieces of code. But this is as far as we are really concerned. As you can see, the security of the system relies on this chain where it is assumed that the first step is not tampered with and that each step then verifies the integrity of the next step before executing it. This means that it's not possible to replace, for example, the meta loader since the integrity check will fail and the boot process will be aborted. To break this chain of trust, we either need to modify the root of the chain, which in this case is code etched directly into the hardware of the system, or circumvent one of the integrity checks to allow us to modify one of the links in the chain without it being detected. And this second option is exactly what Sony's mistakes enabled. The integrity check is performed with what's called elliptic curve cryptography, ECC for short. Specifically, it uses the ECDSA algorithm, which stands for Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. It is one of several algorithms used to verify the integrity of a piece of data. Furthermore, this is an example of an asymmetric signature scheme, which means that the author of some data can use a private key to create a digital signature and publish the data together with the signature. Anyone in possession of the other half of the key, the public key, is then able to verify this signature to guarantee the authenticity of the data or detect that it has been tampered with. The nice thing about this is that someone who holds the public key can verify a signature but not create a new signature for that key. To understand ECDSA, we will first go through the basics of elliptic curves. In general, an elliptic curve is a set of points satisfying the equations y squared plus a times y equals x cubed plus b times x squared plus c times x times y plus d times x plus e. Quite a mouthful. However, the ones we are interested in specifically satisfy the much simpler equation y squared equals x cubed plus a times x plus b, where x and y are coordinates and a and b are parameters of this curve. In this example, let us pick a to be minus 5 and b to be 8, thus giving the equation y squared equals x cubed minus 5 times x plus 8. Let's draw this curve. We can now create a system where we can pick two points, p with coordinates x1 and y1, and q with coordinates x2 and y2, on this curve, and add them together. This addition, however, does not work the same way as you're probably used to, where you just add up the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates separately. No, this is a different kind of addition, which is a little bit more complicated. It works like this. First, we draw a line through p and q. This line will intersect the curve at the third point. 
From there, we draw a new vertical line and follow it to where it crosses the curve again. This point where it crosses the curve is the result of the addition. We call this point R. Now, for this to work completely, we also have to introduce another special point, which we call O or zero. This point can be thought of as lying infinitely far away from the curve. There are a few other cases to consider, and I put some links in the description to a more thorough explanation, including some nice interactive tools. Of course, doing this in a graphical way like this is a good visualization to get a better feel for what's going on. But when doing this in a computer, we instead use a couple of different formulas that can be derived from this general idea. This is all well and good and serves as a nice graphical introduction to elliptic curves. But this is not how they're used in cryptography. Notice how we assume that the points we were talking about were all points with real valued coordinates. And this is why we get this nice smooth curve when we plot it. What if we instead restrict ourselves to just integers? then the curve would look something like this instead. Now, what if we further restricted ourselves by taking the integers from zero up to 36, and we did all of our calculations modulo 37? The curve would look like this instead. Now you might say, hold up, that doesn't look like a curve at all. And I would agree, but we still call this an elliptic curve and the calculations check out. Take this point, 9, 10, for example, Let's check that it is indeed on the curve, which means that it should satisfy our equation. y squared equals x cubed minus 5 times x plus 8. Let's start with the left-hand side. 10 squared is equal to 100. And modulo 37 gives us 26. Now, let's look at the right-hand side. 9 cubed is 729. Minus 5 times 9 is 684 plus 8 is 692. Taking this modulo 37 gives us 26. So the left and the right hand side of this equation are equal, so the point is in fact on the curve. And this is true for all of the other points plotted here. Now, the cool thing with this is that the rules for addition described previously still works for these points, even if it doesn't really make sense visually anymore. So far, I've talked about addition, in which case we add two points together to get the third point as a result. But what about multiplication? Is there an analogous operation in this context as well? Well, the answer is yes. When multiplying regular integers, we basically say add the second number to itself as many times as the first number. For example, 5 times 3 can be seen as add 3 to itself 5 times to get 15. In a similar way, we define the multiplication of a point with an integer as add this point to itself as many times as this number. For example, 3 times p would mean take the point p, add p to itself, and then add p a third time, and this new point is the result that we get. Now, armed with this knowledge, we can finally get to the ECDSA algorithm. Previously, I used some small numbers to easily illustrate how it all works, but now I will use some of the numbers used in the actual PlayStation 3 implementation. First, we need to decide the parameters of the curve. This includes the numbers a and b, and the modulo to use for our calculations. This module is called p. The following three huge numbers are used in one of these curves in the PlayStation 3. This also means that this curve contains an insane amount of points, which is in a sense what adds to the security of this. We also need a point on this curve that is called the generator point, or g for short. It can't be any point, it has to um, satisfy some specific requirements, which is outside the scope of this video. But in this case, the point has the following x and y coordinates. We also have this number n, which is called the order of g. And this means that if you add g to itself n times, that is, if you multiply n with g, you get the zero point. And these numbers are, in theory, completely public, and there exist sets of these parameters which are standardized and give is, given specific names, such as the curves SECP256R1 and curve 25519. In the specific cases of the PlayStation 3, these parameters are embedded in the console. Next, a private key is created by picking a random number between 1 and n. And this private key is kept secret at Sony's headquarters and not published anywhere. And using the definition of multiplication, as described before, we multiply this private key with the generator point. 
This gives us a new point on the curve. And this point is called the public key, which is also public information. In this specific case, it is embedded in the PlayStation 3 console. And in this case, it has the following coordinates. Now, this is where the security comes in. If you have G and the private key D, it's very easy to calculate the public key Q here. But if you have the public key Q and this generator point G, there is no way to calculate what number G was multiplied with to generate Q. This is in contrast with regular multiplication where it would be easy to, for example, take 15 and divide it by three to get five to see that three was added to itself five times to get 15. The system only allows us to sign a number, specifically a number with the same number of bits as N. We want to sign a block of code. So how do we do this? Well, first we take all the data we want to sign and run it through a cryptographic hash function. And then we take the output of that hash function and treat it as a number. On the PS3 specifically, the SHA-1 hash function was used. So let's say that the program we want to sign is the string hello world. We take the SHA-1 hash of that string and then we treat it as a number like this. This is the message we will sign. We call this number Z. The next step is really important. Keep this in mind. And it is to generate a random number between 1 and n. And this number is called k. So we do this and get this number. We then multiply the generator point with this random number to get the following point with these coordinates. We then discard the y coordinate and take the x coordinate modulo n. This new value is called r. And in our case, it has this value. If r happens to be 0 here, we redo the two previous steps with a new random number. Finally, we multiply the private key D with this random number R, and then we add the message we want to sign C, and we multiply all of this with the inverse of K modulo N. And this result is called S. And in our case, it has the following value. Now, we are done, and this pair of R and S together is the signature. This is embedded together with the message to allow for checking its integrity. So how does that work? Let's say we want to verify that the signature RS is valid for the message hello world. So we have the following value. We start by converting the message to a number by running it through a cryptographic hash function, just like before. So we get this number Z. We then calculate u1 and u2 by taking z and r respectively and multiplying with the inverse of s mod n. And we get these two values. We then calculate a new point on the curve by multiplying u1 with g and u2 with the public key q and then adding those two points together. This gives us yet another point with the following coordinates. And it has these values in our case. So again, we discard the y value of this point and take the x coordinate here. And we compare this with the R value in the signature. And if these two values are equal modulo N, the signature is valid. Otherwise, it's invalid. So in our case, we can see that both this X coordinate modulo N and the R value modulo N has this value, which is the same. So the signature is valid. So the two numbers match and the signature is valid. Now, where did Sony go wrong in all of this? Remember in the signing phase when we needed to generate a random number and I said it was important. Let's say that that number wasn't random at all, but instead a fixed number that we used every time we signed something. What would that mean? Let's say we had another message with the signature and it had the signature R prime and S prime. Specifically, let's say we have the signature for the message goodbye world. Notice how R prime is the same as the previous R, but S prime is different. So we know that since R depends only on these fixed values, including this number K, which was reused, R and R prime will be the same. So the two signatures are really RS and RS prime. And now think back on how S was calculated like this. If we take the difference between S and S prime, we get the following equation. And the two messages, the two C's are different, so they stay there. But the R times D term, they are equal, so they will cancel out. And this leaves us with just this equation, 
s minus s prime is equal to the inverse of k multiplied by the difference of c and c prime. Now, using some algebra, we can rearrange this such that the difference between c and c prime multiplied with the inverse of the difference between s and s prime is equal to k. But we know all of these values on the left hand side. We have c, c prime, s, and s prime. So we can just plug in all of those values and calculate the value k which we can do and get this value. Now notice that this is indeed the same k that we used before. So again, we look at how s is calculated like this. s is inverse of k multiplied with c plus r times d. Now rearranging this again, we get this equation where s multiplied with k minus c and all of that multiplied with the inverse of r is equal to d. And we know s and we know k, and we know z, and we know r. So we can plug in all of those values from one of the signatures and use that to calculate d. And we get the following value. So that means by using two different messages, which both use the same k to sign them, instead of using a random one, we can then extract the private key. And with this private key, we can sign any message we want. And this is exactly what happened with the PlayStation 3. Sony used this specific value for every signature instead of a random one each time. This was used to sign multiple things, including the meta loader in the PS3 boot chain of trust. This means that by extracting the meta loader and the corresponding signatures from two different consoles, it was possible to use this flaw to recover the secret key. Then you could use this to create a new meta loader, sign it with that private key and gain full control of any software run after that stage in the boot process, including running both pirated games and homebrew. And this is why this K number is my favorite mega number. So this video is part of a playlist under the hashtag MegafabNumbers, where a group of maths YouTuber and some other people have created videos about their favorite numbers over 1 million. Check out the hashtag and the playlist for the other videos. If you're interested in learning more about IT security and related topics, consider subscribing to my channel and please leave a comment about what you thought about this video. Thank you for watching.